So, and you will find the links to all the different threads uh, in the description of the, of the session. So you have the links and you can go there directly. So um, just to get a little bit of a quick overview on the, on the HIV front in the HIS, as you know, um, and also um, it was mentioned in the in the previous session, the, the general session, since 2017, the University of Oslo team has been designed as a WHO collaborating center for innovation and implementation. And um, this has led to the design and, um, and the publication of a series of uh, uh, WHO approved metadata packages. Uh, on the HIV front, we have at the moment out and available for everyone to download the HIV standard configuration package, which also co we call it core package because it's the aggregate package and it has all the core uh, information that a program might uh, want to collect in order to, to follow it up. It comes also with, uh, with some uh, predefined dashboards on burden and different levels of analysis depending on national, district, and facility levels. At the moment, the core package is uh, used uh, and uh, implemented in, 24, in 27 countries, and uh, four countries are under development and uh, will probably be operational soon. On the um, kind of preview side of things, uh, we are gonna soon um, release uh, also an HIV stock report, given the, um, the fact that the HIS is so widespread and uh, information can be collected very easily at facilities, uh, facility level, um, the WHO has also um, come up with some WH with recommended logistic indicators that can be collected directly from, uh, from uh, the, the facility level. But this is coming soon. This is not quite out yet. And, uh, and finally, uh, we know that uh, the, the follow-up of uh, cohorts and in general longitudinal programs is incredibly complex and a lot of countries and organizations have come up with different ways to collect this information, included in DHIS too. So we are still working in, um, with the, the WHO, of course, in a, a case-based surveillance tracker of course, to continue promoting good design practices as usual, but most importantly, to support the new strategic guidelines. This is of course, just a work in, pro in progress, but uh, we might be open soon to um, pilot the, the, the tracker in some countries if they are interested, so they can contact us and we can see what, how we can progress. So for today's presentation, um, it has been structured a little bit in two parts. Uh, so the first two presentations are going to be um, about uh, mostly how some simple yet strategic adaptations of the HIS2 HIS products can support the monitoring the follow-up of, uh, of HIV programs. The first presentation is going to be by Dr. Keshap, um, who will give us like an overview of the linkage of HIV programs with uh, um, you, the use of data for monitoring and follow-up with uh, the recycling, if we can call it like that, but the application uh, um, of scorecards. Then we will move on to David Nasbeck, um, who will show us how we can apply simple, similar designs to similar um, data, uh, to similar uses across programs and, uh, and, um, and interventions. Um, then we're going to move forward to data analysis and data collection, because as we mentioned, HIV and in general, any kind of longitudinal program is incredibly difficult at times. And uh, Jenny Manza is going to show us some really interesting walkarounds to analyze normal, what normally are incredibly complex indicators. And finally, we have um, Nani. Nani Lungu, uh, who will show us how uh, to optimize data collection, because of course there is no analysis if there is no good collection, um, uh, of uh, um, an HIV SRH integrated program. So without further ado, I leave the floor to Dr. Keshap. Uh, thank you. 
Let me share my screen. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Keshav Deva, working as a strategic information specialist at National Center for AIDS and STD Control in Nepal. And I'm pleased to present on behalf of my co-authors. And my presentation topic is use of DHIS2 tracker for implementation of differentiated service delivery for HIV treatment in Nepal. So I'll present uh, about the concept of DSD approach and early warning indicators of HIV drug resistance. In addition, I will explain how we are monitoring early warning indicators of HIV drug resistance. In short, we call it EWI of HIVDR using DSIS2 tracker and ensuring implementation of core principle of DSD for HIV treatment in Nepal. So what is the DSD approach? Uh, to raise different national and global targets, differentiated approaches are needed to meet the diverse needs and expectations of all people living with HIV and to enhance the effectiveness of HIV services. Uh, DSD approach is prioritized in HIV program globally that is moving away from a one size fits all model. DSD tailors HIV services to diverse group of PLSIV while maintaining the principles of public health approach which is defined as a client center approach that simplifies and adapts HIV services across the cascade in a way that both solve the needs of PLSIV better and most importantly, reduce unnecessary burdens on the health system. So in layman terms, DST approach prioritize those clients or patients needing more intensive services than those clinically stable clients who do not require frequent visits to health centers due to good retention in care, Etc. So for implementing DSD for HIV treatment, it's not easy uh, uh, because of the following challenges, such as low number of overburdened health workers and limited resources in many low and middle income countries, which is also further fueled by using paper-based registers, which impede the prioritizations of clients, patients for delivery of health services as per their need and expectations. This is even more challenging for HIV program when we need to monitor treatment outcomes of patients for whole life using paper-based register. So to address these challenges of paper-based registers and ensure the implementation of core principle of DSD for HIV treatment, we have rolled out DHIS2 tracker in 2017 in all HIV treatment centers of Nepal. So we decided to monitor early warning indicators of HIV DR because in limited resource health system like Nepal, the emergence of drug resistant HIV is a potential public health threat and undermining long-term effectiveness of first-line antiretroviral regimens. So these EWI indicators are helping us to monitor and minimize the emergence of preventable HIV drug resistance and maintaining the effectiveness of uh, these uh, therapy regimens. So our primary aim for this whole system is that sites can easily identify those patients or clients who are at risk of drug resistance, emergence of drug resistance, and prioritize services as per their need. So to develop our EWI, to monitor EWI of HIV drug resistance, we have selected these five indicators and we have provided targets to HIV treatment centers, we call it ARD centers for each indicator for indicator on time pill pickup, the target set was more than 90%, which means if there are 100 patients enrolled in treatment, then more than 90 patients should pick their pill on time. If it's below that target, that means the patient at the sites are at risk of emergence of HIV drug resistance. Similarly, the target was more than 85% for retention and care. And similarly, 85%, more than 85% for real suppression, viral load suppression and 100% of ARD sites should ensure no ARV stockouts. So I have like provided between slide number seven and 17, the detailed definitions, how we calculated numerator and denominator for each indicator uh, for early warning indicators. But due to limited time for presentations, I will not go through in detail, but it can be useful for others if they want to use it in their countries to monitor EWI of HIV drug resistance. So this is the definition, numerator, denominator, and target for on-time pill pickup. Uh, and then similarly, this is for retention and care. 
uh, it is just for the reference and uh, what is the target and similarly and the indicator number three is dispensing practices so these uh, the, this, uh, like developing indicator for this indicator is very tricky because it covers so many factors but what we did is we have provided all the available ARV combination list in the DSIS2 tracker. If sites select other resume than from the list, then we consider it as target not met. And we contact sites immediately for not prescribing standard recommended combination therapy to PLSIV. So this is the target for this one. And for virological suppression, uh, we have like target uh, divided as per their age if there is if the client or patient is less than close to two years, then for good performance is uh, this target is 70%. If uh, the client is more than two years old or all adults, then the target is uh, more than 85%. So similarly, we also uh, define the uh, no ARB uh, drug stock outs at the sites. So now I'm going to uh, present about how it works at the sites. So at SIB treatment centers, uh, there are patients who are enrolled in treatment for different time periods. For example, some are recently enrolled while others are on treatment for more than five years. So we want to see their uh, EWI indicators differently than lumping all patients together. For this purpose, we have divided PLSIB into seven groups. So the group A means no, like on treatment for less than a year, whereas group Z means on SIV treatment for at least six years. So how we calculate it is we take two time period. One is data of ART initiation. Another is data of EWI analysis. Based on this period, we define all PLSIV into seven groups. So at the side, how they record the data? This is one example of viral load separation. Each patient's status recorded in tracker during follow-up visit of PLSIV. And all the required uh, uh, like date or variables such as viral load sample collection date, date of reporting of viral load and viral load separation status, what was the value. So the sites record each patient details into tracker. And uh, in addition to this viral load separation, they follow the similar procedures for other indicators like for retention, on-time pill pickup, and dispensing practices. But for indicator five, that is for ARB stuck out. So for to record the information related to it, we have created data set entry form in Tracker uh, so that the sites can record like whether they have experienced any stock out in particular month or not. If yes, then they select the resume for how many number of days they experience this stock out. So this is the way the sites record the information related to each indicators. So based on this uh, uh, recording, uh, then the HIV treatment centers or the health workers at the different level uh, monitor the different indicators related to EWI of HIV drug resistance. This is one example. Like uh, we like the incorporated scorecard in our uh, tracker information system with the help of uh, HISP India. And all the results of these five indicators are displayed in the PIVO table scorecard where the site or uh, health workers working at different levels can source this scorecard. And we, or we are also provided this link into their dashboard so that they can uh, click on that link and access the scorecard directly. So this is uh, one example how the national and province level uh, monitor uh, the one indicator retention in care, such as at the federal level, we can monitor the status of retention in care indicator by province. Province can also monitor uh, their overall province status. They can also monitor the site level and uh, district level uh, status. Similarly, what happens at the site is, uh, this site can also, monitor indicator specific progress, both aggregated data and also individual level data. Since it was not possible to go directly from aggregated data presented using a scorecard to individual level data, we also develop uh, early warning indicators line list report from where they can also identify specific individuals who are performing well or poor. For the figure here shown is uh, the example of how decides 
identify the patients who are lost to follow. So now I'm going to present like how we are using the GSIS to tracker for evidence informed response to present, prevent emergence of HIV drug resistance. Uh, for indicator one, if like if patient is not performing well, uh, then site can contact that PLHIV immediately or send a reminder SMS to the client which is, which is inbuilt within our tracker information system, or they can coordinate with community home-based care and peer navigator team to ensure client have access to medicines on time. Similar approach is also used in retention and care. If some, some PLSIV is doing well in retention, then that PLSIV is eligible for monthly month dispensing. So they do not have to travel every month just to pick up their pill. And for dispensing practices, uh, the health workers working at the federal level and province level, they can easily identify the sites with poor dispensing practices. And after identifying that, then we can guide them to ensure and practice good dispensing practices. These are the few examples how we are using it. For viral load suppressions, the site can easily identify the PLSI with unsurpassed viral load and refer them to the clinicians for further assessment or modifications in the treatment plan. For ARB stuck out, it is also really important for the health workers working at the federal and the province level. They can easily identify those HIV treatment sites who frequently report stock outs or demand or request emergency ARB request. So it helps us to pinpoint those sites so that we can guide them for timely analysis or submissions of bi-monthly requisition form so that we can to avoid ARB stock out in future. So these are the some of the few examples how sites and federal uh, the health workers working at the different different levels can use the scorecard for the informed response. So in overall, this is an example how we can use DSIS to track out that feed required information and alerts health workers specific areas which require attention and support overall optimization of patient care. The most important thing is that site can start analyzing data for improvement of services rather than collecting and reporting to the higher authorities, which is happens most of the time because they collect so many variables and they just use it for reporting purposes to the higher level only. And the use of routine health facility data is very limited, which also they can analyze this and use this system to identify the need of different PLSIV so that can, they can plan and respond their responses as per their need, which may also help to ensure implementation of DSD approach. Since we also record each follow-up visit data of PLHIV, then we are also using like DSIS to track our longitudinal data in research to improve our program and interventions. One of our research is ongoing to assist longitudinal changes and factors associated with retention and loss to follow up, missing in test, test and treat error among people living with HIV in Nepal. And this is the end of my presentations. Here I have provided a link for our YouTube channel. And if someone wants to contact us, then I've also provided email. And I've also provided a references link which defines more clearly what is DSD and EWI of HIV drug resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Special. It's it's outstanding. Like it was a brilliant way to maintain and visualize the data and and also maintain the analysis at uh, at site level. And as you said, uh, sometimes the people just collect the data just for reporting, not for actually using it and analyzing it. Outstanding. So yes, thank you. Next one, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria. Hello, everyone, and good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you might be. My name is David Nesbitt, and I am a technical business analyst with BAO Systems, headquartered in Washington, DC, uh, but I am physically located in Bogota, Colombia. I work specifically on the DHIS2 instance of the US government's HIV epidemiological data collection system, known as DATUM. DATUM is the primary HIV data collection system for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief Program, widely known as PEPFAR. The project I am highlighting here is about solutioning a cumbersome reporting process made even better by transforming a public metadata package for adverse events from immunizations into a VMMC adverse event reporting tool in our DHIS2 instance. 
I have the pleasure of working closely with my colleague, Muhammad Salihu, also with BAO, whose expertise made all the development work possible. This first section will provide some definitions, context, and background for our project. To start, let's answer what is VMMC and why is it part of PEPFAR? VMMC stands for Voluntary Medical Male Circumcision. And PEPFAR funds VMMC programs as part of its prevention portfolio because studies have shown it reduces female to male transmission of HIV uh, by 60%. It, also, it is also recommended by the WHO and UNAIDS that VMMC programming be implemented in countries with a high HIV prevalence. As such, partners involved in PEPFAR, <clears throat> excuse me, PEPFAR VMMC programming should identify and report any adverse events. The definition of a VMMC adverse event is any injury, harm, or undesired outcome that occurred during or following the male circumcision procedure. This includes not only events related to any error in screening, performance, or follow-up of the procedure, but those in which no error may have occurred. These events are considered notifiable to PEPFAR if funded through their programming. An example use case of adverse event reporting can be taken from a decade ago between VMMC and tetanus. There had been an increase of VMMC adverse events where tetanus was cropping up after the procedures. It was determined that while the WHO had been recommending a tetanus vaccination series, as well as booster doses through adolescence and young adulthood, it turns out that they were predominantly provided for young women as part of maternal and neonatal tetanus elimination programs. As a result, low proportion of males had tetanus immunity, especially in the age group seeking circumcision and combined with several other factors like males delaying or not seeking medical attention and a low quality of supportive care that this unknown risk was discovered and a plan could be made. The good news is through adverse event reporting, investigation and surveillance, PEPFAR worked with implementing partners, ministries of health and WHO to support the implementation of tetanus mitigation strategies and push tetanus as part of the pre-screen pre for VMMC, VMMC clients. <clears throat> However, despite PEPFAR's mature DHIS2 implementation status and the great importance of adverse event reporting, PEPFAR's HIV prevention team continues to have a PDF, Excel, and email-based process, which you can see an example of on the slide here. So over time, as calls for data and reporting have become more complex, the current process has become even harder to track and manage, especially since it's separated from the rest of PEPFAR's data ecosystem. So now that you have some context and background to our problem, this next section will tell our transformation story for upgrading data collection, reporting, and analysis. At first we asked, what can we do? So we met with the PEPFAR HIV prevention team to determine that our DHIS2 platform would be perfect since it's already the primary data collection tool. We then developed a rapid prototype using the BAO systems import foundry to convert their PDF form into a DHIS2 event capture app form. And as a side note, if you are not familiar with the import foundry, it's a free DHIS2 metadata creation app tool available on the BAO systems website. Really great, really handy. Uh, so then we presented our rapid prototype um, in a demo to PEPFAR leadership, where it was decided to continue upgrading the adverse event reporting process. However, with the added challenge of only using native DHIS2 functionality, meaning little to no customization for this reporting process. Right at the same time, and much to my delight, DHIS2 and the WHO released a public standard metadata package for adverse, event, adverse events following immunization reporting. This metadata package gave us the perfect foundation for sticking to native DHIS2 functionality while still allowing for some customizations we could use to enhance this new process. It basically let us avoid developing a customized from scratch tracker program that would have required a costly and time consuming requirements discovery and development phase. All our team had to do is convert our capture app prototype into a tracker program using the AFI program tracker. Um, which I'm sure makes Muhammad chuckle since it's much easier said than done. Uh, their prepackaged program allows us to have longitudinal updates to the adverse events report as information is gathered while also providing automated system generated emails to notify relevant teams as these investigations unfold. It still lets us utilize the same PEPFAR geographic hierarchy as well as other data streams. 
and it's in the same system implementing partners are already accessing. Finally, data is stored directly in a relational database after being entered and can be queried using built-in data data visualization and dynamic dashboard functionality. Which brings me to this example of our converted VMMC adverse event enrollment in Tracker. Users will, <coughs> excuse me, users will register the adverse event starting with the date of the VMMC procedure or device placement. And as you've probably realized by now, this is very sensitive data. So we restricted enrollment data to non-identifiable unique IDs. From there, they begin filling out each relevant event stage. However, and as, and as I just mentioned, uh, further data privacy concerns mean that our users won't be able to load an event stage without selecting a specific PEPFAR funding mechanism, which further restricts data access in our instance. Additionally, no personally identifiable information is collected in the program. And I also want to mention that major improvements for transforming this process to Tracker is that we get to incorporate automated skip validation logic and program rules and warnings for things like PII. As for adverse event analysis, here you can see an example of dummy data from our test environment for things like a line listing report, a pie chart of circumcision devices, um, or a bar graph of primary NAE reported events by age. And then um, here I put examples of dynamic dashboards with our dummy data, which are great because as many of you may know, dashboards can be privately shared. <laughs> and analytic objects are updated in near real time as the data comes in, which is great for us and definitely great for our clients. <clears throat> in conclusion, leveraging a standard metadata package with a similar purpose was an effective way to rapidly adapt DHIS2 metadata to enable a practical implementation, ultimately saving us time and resources. Given the speed and success of our development, PEPFAR is considering applying the same rapid prototyping model for other reportable adverse events, such as for cervical precancerous lesion treatment. We're currently preparing to upgrade our instance to 2.36, but anticipate our new VMMC NAE reporting program will go live in just a few weeks, roughly uh, mid-July. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and ask them on the DHIS2 community of practice uh, for this topic. Um, from immunization to circumcision adverse events. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that was a great example of how mm. the metadata package, package approach is, is working in a way. Um, that, then I would like to give the floor to Jenny. Jenny Wenza, who is gonna present us about her their way to collect and analyze very complex indicators. Or is it yours? Uh, thank you, Victoria. Can you confirm that you can see my slides? Indeed, I do. Super, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I will be speaking about the development of a harmonized uh, OVC MIS um, for use by USAID Zimbabwe using the DHIS2 tracker. Uh, my name is Jenny Wanza and I'm with Datafy. I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors uh, for this presentation. Uh, Sarah Miner of USAID Zimbabwe collaborates closely with us um, on, on the development of this instance. And Mohamed Salihu, also of Datafy of BAO Systems, um, who leads our technical team. Um, so a few words about Datafy. Uh, we're a global HIV AIDS project funded by USAID um, for five years, working to accelerate the end of the HIV epidemic um, by improving processes across the data value chain. So in this year, um, we are supporting 14 countries and among them Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, we are working to develop a harmonized case management information system um, to collect information on orphans and vulnerable children um, across six different implementing partners. So Datafy led by Palladium along with resource partner BAO Systems uh, has supported the development of this instance um, with the intention of streamlining reporting uh, for both Zimbabwe specific indicators um, and also for reporting to PEPFAR. So we are currently in the final stages of development uh, with legacy data migration ongoing presently um, and rollout planned for August this year. 
Uh, so why develop a harmonized MIS? Um, with over 250,000 um, beneficiaries being served by uh, a number of different IEPs who in turn then uh, work with and engage uh, community-based organizations, uh, each implementing partner had a different um, information management system, which led to certain limitations. Um, there was certainly the, the possibility um, that slightly different definitions of services being provided um, and variations in calculations um, uh, contributed to diminished data reliability. Uh, additionally, data was submitted on a monthly basis um, via an Excel tracker to USAID um, to support their decision making, um, which represents a delay between um, service delivery and reporting. And then additionally, the costs of maintaining separate systems, um, each with their own administrators. So in terms of the system that we um, were asked to build, um, this system was intended to calculate um, PEPFAR indicators, uh, primarily on the continuity of comprehensive case management. So longitudinal services being provided to orphans and vulnerable children, um, potentially across many years. Um, and another key indicator set um, being the documentation of HIV status of all those beneficiaries. So data is collected at ward within districts um, and that data needs to be attributed to the community-based organizations. Um, and of course, these key indicators need to um, be displayed by fine age and sex disaggregates um, for the six month reporting periods. In addition to these indicators, we also provide um, data and collect data and, and visualize data um, specific to the Zimbabwean context. In terms of the implementation challenges we faced, um, we'll explore some of the challenges related to actual definition of active beneficiaries, and then the inverse of that as well. Um, how do we measure when uh, beneficiaries have not received the requisite services to be considered active? Uh, another aspect that was very interesting um, was the accumulation of indicators with different time dimensions. And then finally, um, the visualization of results for, for reporting to PEPFAR and also for, for internal performance monitoring. So beginning with um, the identification of active beneficiaries, um, PEPFAR uh, MER 2.5 guidance um, defines active beneficiaries as those um, beneficiaries who have a current case management plan, have also received a household monitoring visit, and um, have received a qualifying service appropriate um, for their age group. So here we can see a graph um, collecting information on all of our beneficiaries. And the first three bars represent those sub-criteria with the last bar then representing those children who um, had achieved active status. So the active status can never be greater um, than the combination of any of the other uh, criteria. So in addition, the, the, these scripted indicators um, would then needed to be further disaggregated by age group and then again accumulated. So here in this screenshot, um, here we see examples of our um, HIV status indicators. And what we can tell here is that HIV status is then collected um, and filtered according only to those individuals who have achieved this active status. So actually a complex scripted indicator is then applied to another set of indicators around HIV status. So moving on to look now at the inverse, how do we measure those children? How do we identify those children who did not receive um, the requisite services? And what we know um, is that historically programs uh, have identified these children through self-report. So we relied on caseworkers who then um, were expected to proactively report those who were lost to follow-up um, or experiencing an interruption in case management. Um, and as such, uh, many of these reports are not made um, and beneficiaries were neither active nor lost to follow up. Um, and so this challenge is, is an interesting one. Um, and here we see um, a description of the scripted logic that was used um, to identify these in inactive beneficiaries, essentially starting with all beneficiaries and then through a process subtracting different subcategories to ultimately leave us with those individuals who are considered inactive. Uh, 
And here we see a snapshot of some of the logs from the script in action. Um, it has been scheduled to run on the server once a day for TEIs updated in the previous two days. Um, and for those of you familiar with this PEPFAR indicator, um, this indicator represents just one component of the larger indicator around exit without graduation. So again, accumulation of multiple sub indicators to produce the final indicator. So taking a look now at, at accumulating, how we can accumulate indicators that have different time dimensions. Um, so here we describe uh, two different types of indicators, um, the first being point in time. So these indicators aim to capture the status of a beneficiary at the end of a reporting period. Um, and so by definition, um, these uh, children cannot be summed across reporting periods because they would be duplicate children. However, uh, for beneficiaries to be reported at the semester, we needed to do precisely that, um, is we needed to determine their status um, at quarter one and at quarter two to measure um, whether or not um, they had received continuous services. So an interesting um, configuration challenge. And then a more traditional um, indicator type would be a cumulative count where um, beneficiary status could be summed across reporting periods. And graduation would be a better example of that. So here we have the five top level indicators uh, for OVC reporting to PEPFAR. Um, and out of the five, we have um, two that are point in time and three that are cumulative. And so, as I mentioned, these indicators again require complex scripting logic. Um, because they must evaluate the status inside each of the quarters that, uh, of which the semester is comprised, and they cannot be summed across time periods. And um, the grand indicator of them all, perhaps the most complicated, is, as I mentioned before, those who are deemed to be exit without graduation at the semester. Um, so this is an, an interesting indicator in itself because it actually combines um, both uh, point in time and cumulative indicators. And so we used a combination of offset periods um, and leveraging program indicators as well as mixed indicators in order to uh, create this final indicator. <clears throat> and the last implementation challenge I'd like to address um, is how we might visualize or filter um, these longitudinal data um, from an aggregate perspective. So while we know that the tracker module um, brings to life longitudinal indicators, um, typically um, these indicators are best visualized uh, according to the organizational hierarchy. So here we see an example where the data um, is broken out by province, and so that is a, a native function of DHIS2 tracker. However, um, it's not possible um, to display the same data um, either by age and sex disaggregate or by implementing partner and CBO um, without additional scripting. So here we see a, just a screenshot, um, a, actually a very small screenshot of all of the scripted logic uh, that was used to produce um, the visualizations and reports required um, both for PEPFAR and for internal reporting. And um, what our technical team um, created was a tracker aggregate integration process. So I'd like to acknowledge again, Mohammed Salihu, who, um, who is the creative genius behind this. Um, each required indicator was, was created as an aggregate data element with a category combination. Um, so the disaggregation for age and sex, and then assigned to a data set using subpartner as attributes. So in order to pull data for one data element and all its COCs, we required a total of 768 program indicators and mapping indicators for each um, required indicator. A custom solution was used to pull data from the mapping indicators and then push into the aggregate data elements. Um, on a daily basis. And so we're using API calls um, in addition that were then created for quarterly and semesterly uh, indicator groups. As I mentioned before, we needed for the other indicators. So uh, this solution now allows us to be able to visualize data both by implementing partner and CBO. Um, and ultimately here you can see a table um, where the results are presented by CBO, 
and by the fine age and sex disaggregates. Um, so this represents um, a novelty because it's giving us this information not only um, by the organizational hierarchy, but um, also by the implementing partners. And that allows us to produce these types of visuals um, to better manage programs. So in terms of reflections, um, the creation of a harmonized OVC MIS allows for standardization um, of indicators across implementing partners. And of course, um, the benefits of access to real-time data um, supports um, real-time course corrections. Uh, we anticipate long-term cost savings um, by maintaining and enhancing one national um, MIS via coordination mechanism. And uh, of course, tracking of individual beneficiaries across time provides real insights um, into how to better meet the needs of the vulnerable populations. Um, and in closing, of course, we just always need to take into account the complexities of how reporting require um, expert configuration and extensive backend scripting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'm sure there are a lot of people will follow up with you because these are always very tricky. And um, running the same wave of cost saving and uh, follow up of programs, uh, um, I leave the floor to many. Nanny, I think you are uh, on mute still. I can see your screen, but I cannot hear you. Is it just me? All right. Oh, now here. Now here. Share my screen now, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, just depending on the different uh, places that we are attending this meeting from. So I am Neni Lungu, the Senior Technical Advisor for the Malawi Empower uh, Activity. And uh, I would also want to recognize the co-authors uh, towards uh, uh, the submission, as well as the drafting of uh, the abstract that we submitted uh, to this uh, uh, HS2 annual conference, and let me also recognize uh, the presence of uh, these co authors who are within us uh, on this group. And we have uh, Linda Nyondo, who is our SI uh, regional uh, director, and we also have uh, Matthew Kankurungo, who is actually who is our database as well as a uh, HMIS uh, manager. And Dr. Ponfes Market, who is the chief of party, as well as uh, Yona Nyondo, who is our senior uh, MD uh, officer. And I'll be presenting on the uh, optimizing the digital uh, data collection uh, using the DHIS2 in addressing girls and the uh, young women programming. And this is a case of uh, uh, the Malawi Empower uh, activity. So, in terms of uh, uh, the flow of uh, uh, the presentation, uh, first we are going to look at the background information, and then we're also going to look at the processes that it actually, we actually undertook to make sure that we have uh, the data is to track and place. Then we're going to also unearth the key findings. Then I'll actually conclude by uh, sharing uh, a conclusion, a statement. So um, in terms of uh, uh, the background, so uh, Malawi Empower um, is an acronym uh, standing for Expanding Malawi HIV and AIDS Prevention with a Local Organization, working for an effective uh, epidemic uh, response. So this is uh, uh, a USAID uh, five-year uh, funded project, which uh, began uh, on the 5th of March, 2020 and it's expected to phase out uh, on the 4th of March, 2025. So the overall uh, goal of the project is to support government of Malawi commitment to epidemic control by stopping HIV transmission and preventing new infections among addressing girls and young women aged between uh, 10 to 24 year olds. And the, uh, the activity is actually being implemented in two districts of uh, Malawi. 
and these are the districts in the southern region of Malawi, looking at the HIV prevalence in the two districts, and these are the dreams districts, and they include Zomba as well as the Machinga district. The project is actually being implemented through two local implementing partners, who include the Christian Health Association of Malawi, commonly known as CHAM, as well as Pagajere Institute for uh, Development, as well as uh, Institute for Development and uh, Communication. So the uh, next through the slide, we are actually seeing uh, a, snapshot, a snapshot in terms of uh, the two implementing uh, dreams uh, districts targeting the adolescent girls and the uh, young women. So the Maui Empower Activity is actually a large scale multifaceted program that provides uh, sexual as well as uh, reproductive health services to more than uh, 40,000 adolescent girls and young women across the two districts of uh, Machinga as well as the uh, Zomba districts. And uh, the project actually uh, used the DHS2 to ensure the availability of uh, um, high quality uh, data. So in terms of uh, um, the limitations that were there at the inception of uh, the project, one that we actually uh, had to, uh, one challenge that we actually experienced as a project was uh, uh, on the, the volume of uh, the adolescent girls and young women uh, data that we are supposed to collect as a project, like I mentioned, that we are actually uh, tracking over 40,000 adolescent girls and young women with the different uh, SRH as well as the uh, HIV uh, services. Therefore, this actually also uh, initiated us to make sure that uh, there is uh, uh, the real-time data collection uh, concept whereby uh, data was being collected at different uh, time points as well as at different uh, places. However, considering that the project is located in the two districts, of which some of the facilities are located in the, the rural areas of the two districts, we had actually also encountered the uh, intermittent as well as the limited the uh, internet uh, connectivity across the two facil the facilities that we're working with in the two districts. In the same vein, we also had the experienced the, um, uh, data entry cost, especially uh, paying for uh, data to actually be transported, to be uh, transformed from the paper-based into the tonic uh, management system, as, also, as well as also uh, cost in the purchases for uh, computers to make sure that the data is actually uh, keyed in uh, and also that it can actually be used for uh, rigorous uh, data analysis. So now the question that we actually uh, uh, we might be asking ourselves is, then what was the process? How did we do it as a uh, Malawi Empower Activity? So the process began somewhere around in June, 2020, whereby um, we developed a data set using the DHIS2 tracker, which was actually running on uh, the version 2.33.8. And uh, this was actually capturing the longitudinal data for uh, SRH, as well as HIV services that are provided to the adolescent girls and uh, young women uh, during the monthly community outreach uh, meetings that we are actually conducting as a, a project. And uh, then uh, the DHS2 tracker actually uh, was able to collect individual level data and uh, it runs both on the computer as well as on Android devices for offline uh, data capture. So we actually purchased um, Android devices for our data entry a team so that they can actually be uh, using to actually uh, capture uh, data into the shared database. At the same time, um, we also made sure that uh, we actually build the capacity of both the, the strategic information uh, team uh, members who include the m and assistants and also not building only the SI uh, team capacity, but we also made sure that uh, all other program staff are also uh, trend of uh, how the tracker was actually uh, performing. Similarly, we have actually also been able to develop standard operating procedures 
that can actually be uh, used as uh, aid documents to make sure that uh, they assist in the day-to-day -day planning as well as operationalizing of uh, the DHIS2 uh, tracker, tracker database. So currently the uh, tracker is actually uh, deployed to capture individual level data at about 40 community outage sites. Um, and uh, we are actually uh, capturing uh, data for over 40,000 addressing girls and young women uh, on a monthly basis. And uh, um, in terms of uh, the services that are actually captured within the tracker, we are actually collecting HIV uh, testing data, uh, STI screening data, as well as the uh, family planning methods that are actually provided to the addressing girls and young women. And this is in addition to the sexual and reproductive healthy talks that are provided to the addressing girls and young women at uh, outreach uh, sites. Now, what has actually been the key uh, findings or key successes that we have actually seen following the development of uh, the tracker? One, we can actually summarize our key uh, findings into three. One is on the uh, data merging. So using the tracker, we collected the uh, data at multiple sites and the DHS2 tracker has actually allowed, allowed us for instant messaging, merging of uh, longitudinal uh, records. Unlike uh, other routine statistical software where the process was actually taking us more than a week to complete the merging process. So we have actually been able to save time in as far as uh, the instant message merging of the records is concerned. In addition to the instant merging, we have actually also seen improved uh, data quality following the automated uh, skip patterns that were embedded within um, the tracker. We have actually been able to make sure that all our data is actually complete as well as uh, make sure that it actually conforms to the other data quality dimensions, including that of uh, data accuracy. Lastly, we have actually also um, been able to minimize on the cost because uh, using the DHIS2 tracker, we have actually been able to save over $10,000 by purchasing tablets instead of uh, uh, computers um, as they were previously needed. And also the tracker uh, has also enabled the project to develop analytical dashboards to perform, to track performance as well as uh, uh, aiding in improving uh, programming. So this uh, snapshot just actually uh, shows uh, some of the uh, dashboards that have actually been developed within the Malawi Power uh, DHIS2 um, uh, track. Uh, lastly, uh, allow me to actually uh, conclude by saying that uh, through the use of the DHIS2 uh, track and the application for longitudinal uh, data collection for the community outreach uh, programs, we have actually been able to collect uh, large data and the, this has actually helped us to make sure that we capture the data at different uh, delivery points, as well as uh, merging instant data to inform programming. And this has actually helped us as well to make sure that the concept of uh, real-time data entry is actually achieved and also making sure that uh, we have actually reduced cost and we can actually be able to uh, scale up the activity. At this moment, let me stop there and uh, thank you so much for your attention. Over. Thank you so much, Nani. That was a great overview of like such a great implementation. Um, this, is, this is it. Uh, our time is up, unfortunately. Um, I hope you enjoyed and you find uh, some of the information that we brought to you today uh, useful enough or at least as a, as a starting point for some problems that you had as well. Um, so if you want, you can continue the discussions and follow up with the, with the presenters in the community practice. And, uh, and yes, the, the recording will be available soon. Thank you so much for today and I hope you enjoy the remaining day. <laughs>